Hi, everybody. Grab a Bible, open it up to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah 9. Names have meaning. When someone decides to have a child, a major undertaking is choosing the name. Should it be a family name? If you're a Christian, should it be a Bible name? Should we research different meanings and then choose? We take our time because names communicate identity. Several years ago, I had the privilege of baptizing Michelle. I met with she and her husband to talk about Christ and his power to forgive. He was already a believer, and she enthusiastically trusted in Christ. So the next Sunday, we got her set up for her baptism. And at the church we were at, we had a portable baptistry, much like we have here, but it was behind uh, some doors in the auditorium. And at the right point of the service, the doors opened, and I introduced Michelle to the hundreds of people in the room. I had them wave to Michelle and say hi, and I led her through the great confession, and I baptized Michelle into Christ. When the doors closed, I got her a towel for her to dry off, and she and her husband were looking at each other really oddly. And I asked if everything was okay, and she said, my name is Crystal. I said, well, when you get to heaven, tell them your reservation is under Michelle. (laughs) The Bible has rich imagery with names. In Scripture, names equal character. So in the Old Testament, we have Jacob. His name literally translates as deceiver. That's exactly what he was. He was a liar through and through. Jesus' name translates as savior. That's exactly what he is. That's often why God will change someone's name when he's about to do a great work in their life. He changes Abram to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah and Jacob to Israel. The Bible gives a large number of names for Jesus. From cover to cover, Jesus is given a few different, few dozen different names and titles that all express different facets of his identity. He is Lord. He is Christ. He is Savior. He is life. He is light. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is rabbi. He is son of God. He is son of man. He is son of David. He's the lamb of God. He's the second Adam. He's the word. Each of those bring out various aspects of who Jesus is and what he's done. For for the next few weeks, we're going to look at four of the titles given to Jesus that will help prepare our hearts for Christmas. And we're going to preach one of the most famous prophecies about Jesus out of the Old Testament that comes from Isaiah 9. In Isaiah chapter 8, God announces to Israel that the Assyrians, this wicked pagan nation, are going to invade and obliterate Israel. This is punishment for their sins. This is something God had threatened to them for generations on end, and they had not listened. They had not repented. And God is always good on his word. In the midst of that dark time with this announcement that this horrific thing is coming, there's a ray of hope listed in it all. Isaiah chapter 9, starting in verse 1. But there will be no more gloom for her who was in anguish. And in earlier times, he treated the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali with contempt. But later on, he shall make it glorious. By the way of the sea on the other side of Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. And those who live in the land of the shadow of death, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation. You shall make great their gladness. They will be glad in your presence as with the gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you shall shatter the yoke of their burden and the staff on their shoulders, the rod of their taskmaster as at the battle of Midian. For every boot of the booted warrior and the rumbling of battle and cloak rolled in blood will be for burning, fuel for the fire. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders. And his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, 
eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of Yahweh of hosts will accomplish this. Yes, it may be dark. They've received horrific news. Terrible things are going to happen, but there's one who is to come. He will bring light into the darkness. He will bring hope to the hopeless. God promises that deliverance is coming in a person. And this deliverer is given some titles to identify who he is and what he will do. And in using those titles, Isaiah is looking forward to the one who would be born to bring salvation to the world. So we're going to spend a few weeks seeing who Jesus is for us. So we begin with Jesus is wonderful counselor. Literally translated, a wonder of a counselor. I love that this one comes first. You know, the other titles speak of his power. This one speaks of his heart. And we see his heart before we see his strength. You know, wonderful counselor is a very personal title. It speaks of the close relationship that the Lord has with his people. Because by nature, counselors have to be very close to the one that they're counseling. So what does this mean for us? How is Jesus our wonderful counselor? Well, a couple of ways. First, he's our counselor in a legal sense. As many of you know, our family had the privilege of adopting a child. I think there's a picture. This is uh, mere minutes after the judge hit the gavel on the bench to declare that Cora was legally a stamps. And then that's when she was much, much, much smaller there in my arms. For the first time in my life, I had an attorney. I'd never needed one before, thankfully. And when I stood in that courtroom, the man on the right, his name is Don. Don was our attorney. He was my counselor. You know, judges refer to attorneys as counselors for a reason. Because essentially, he's there to represent me, to speak in my defense, to tell me what to do, to tell me what to say, to declare to everybody in the courtroom, this case should go in his favor. And the same was true earlier this year when we had to bring in an attorney officially for the second time in our life for legal issues surrounding my dad's end-of-life care. And the word that could sum up the, what a legal counsel does for you is the word advocate, someone who stands with you, someone who stands for you. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The word for advocate in the text is a Greek word that we've talked about before. It's one of our favorites, but I want to reintroduce it to you now because we're going to come back to it here in a few minutes. It's a Greek word, paraclete. It literally translates as one who comes alongside. Para, the, the prefix, alongside in the verb kaleo, to call, who is called and comes alongside, one who stands with me and one who stands for me. Jesus is your advocate. He stands with us. He stands for us in our defense. And why do we need him to do that? Because in God's courtroom, you stand guilty as charged. That's why. There is no denial of the fact that we're guilty, and we really don't have the ability to declare on our own that we're not guilty, because the facts of the case against us dictate we are guilty. We've sinned, and we stand condemned, but Jesus stands in our defense. He represents us before the Father. He's coming alongside of us to stand with us and for us, and, and he declares on our behalf he declares for us that we are indeed innocent because he already paid the penalty. He took care of it in full. And by our faith in him, we are indeed not guilty any longer. That's what the Bible means when it says we are justified. Justified is a legal term that means innocent. 
Some have said justified should be translated as just as if I'd never sinned. All because you have an advocate. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 24 says, But Jesus, on the other hand, because he continues forever, holds his priesthood permanently. Therefore, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Right now, the Lord Jesus stands with the Father in your defense. Secondly, Jesus is our wonderful counselor in a practical sense. If you've ever been to a counselor, whether it's a, a guidance counselor or pastoral counseling or a biblical counselor, you're going because you need advice. You need counsel. You need direction. And counselors do that by telling us what we need to hear. They don't necessarily do that by telling us what we want to hear. They're the ones who have some answers. They're the ones who are in a position to help. Jesus is the one who's in a position to help you. He has the answers that help guide you and provide direction for you. And he most certainly tells us what we need to hear and certainly doesn't usually tell us what we want to hear. Tim Keller writes it this way. He says, in John's gospel, chapter 11, after Lazarus has died, he, Jesus, comes to be with Mary and with Martha and Mary, the sisters. Martha says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus rebukes her. Then Mary comes up and says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus just weeps with her. Same words, by no means the same response. Why? Because Jesus always gives you what you need, and he knows better than you what that is. He's the wonderful counselor. So just like Mary, just like Martha in the midst of that dark time, when you allow Jesus to speak into your life, you get what you need. Not necessarily what you want. And Jesus knows which is better. And we could say, oh, that was great for Mary and Martha. I mean, Jesus was there. He was in their house. That's great for them. We don't have that kind of access to Jesus. We can't just walk up to him. We can't just wait for him to walk into our house and say, hey, let me tell you what to do. Or can we? Because according to the Bible, our access to Jesus is far better than theirs ever was. In John chapter 14, 15, and 16, Jesus takes a good amount of time and explains to his disciples that he's leaving. He's going to the cross, he's going to give his life, and he'll be raised from the dead, and then he's going to ascend into heaven. And they're obviously not at all thrilled about that. But again, Jesus gives what is needed. John chapter 16, verse 6. But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. It's to your advantage that I go away. Really? Because only then the Holy Spirit will come and take up residence in the life of the believer. You don't have to rely on the limited physical presence of Jesus, hoping that maybe by chance you're going to be at the same place at the same time. With the Holy Spirit, God is wherever you are, moment by moment, every day. And multiple times in John 14 and John 16, Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as he did here as the counselor or the comforter or the advocate, depending on what Bible translation you're using. And the Greek word for those titles? Paraclete. The one who comes alongside Jesus through the presence of God the Holy Spirit comes alongside to give you guidance. So what's the point of all of that? All right, Jesus is your wonderful counselor. That sounds great. He does that legally. We, we like that. We appreciate that. He gives us guidance through the Holy Spirit. We like that. We appreciate that. Well, now what? Number one, follow his counsel. He gives it. Follow it. John 14, verse 26. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. John 16, 13. But when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth for he will not speak from himself, but whatever he hears, he will speak 
and he will disclose to you what is to come. The Holy Spirit guides us by leading us to truth, by taking us to the truth of Scripture, by recalling Scripture to our minds at opportune times, by using our regular times of Bible reading to speak to us in relevant ways at just the right time, by always drawing us back to the example and the teaching of Jesus to show the right way of life. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21, and your ears will hear a word behind you. This is the way, walk in it, whenever you turn to the right or to the left. Jesus speaks to us, telling us this is the way, walk in it, this way, not that way. Say these words, not those words. Make this decision, not that one. It's this is the right opportunity, not that one. John Ortberg writes it this way. We often want to be able to hear guidance from God about important decisions, such as whom to marry or what job to take. But we also want to reserve the right to feed our minds on whatever junk comes along. Whatever repeatedly enters the mind occupies the mind, eventually shapes the mind, and will ultimately express itself in what you do and who you become. The events we attend, the material we read or don't, The music we listen to, the images we watch, the conversations we hold, the daydreams we entertain, these are shaping our minds. And ultimately, they make our minds receptive or deaf toward the still small voice of God. So if you want to hear the guidance that the wonderful counselor gives to you, then feed your mind the right stuff. Anchor yourself in Scripture regularly. Renew your commitment. You don't have to wait till January 1st to start reading your Bible. Isn't that great? Because you're going to stop it in mid-February anyway when you hit Leviticus. So start now. (laughs) It will help you. You'll be ahead of the game. He's speaking. Listen. John Stott writes, The greatest single secret of spiritual development lies in personal humble, believing, obedient response to the word of God. Number two, follow his example. Follow his counsel, follow his example. Just as Jesus does this for us, coming alongside of us, the New Testament calls us to do the same thing for those around us, to again, in this same instance, to be Christ-like. And this is to happen in the church corporately, 1 Timothy 4.13, until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. So this is what's to happen when God's people gather together. You read the Bible publicly, we do that. Exhortation, we call that preaching, we do that. There's teaching, we, we do that. The Greek word for exhortation, paraclete. It's interesting to me that one of the words used for preaching in the New Testament is this one to come alongside. That's part of what preaching does. We come alongside you with an open Bible. This is what God has to say. This is the way. Walk in it. It's not just preachers that do this. Elders are called to do the same. Titus 1.9, holding fast the faithful word, which is in accordance with the teaching, so that he'll be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to reprove those who contradict. Again, exhort, paraclete, part of the role of an elder is to come alongside people in the church with an open Bible to do two things, to refute false teaching and to promote good teaching because only the Bible tells the difference. And this same thing is to happen personally in your life and mine. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we'll be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. A lot of comfort in there. Comfort is the word paraclete. So during your times of affliction, God paracletes you. He comes alongside you. Why? so that you can paraclete those around you. How incredible is that? You paraclete someone when you know that someone is hurting, 
and they've endured a loss, and you reach out to them. You send them a card in the mail, you shoot them a quick email, you call them, you visit them, instead of awkwardly avoiding them because you're not really sure what to say, don't do that. Instead, you go and you, you reach out and you tell them you love them. You paraclete someone when you show them tough love, when they've been making foolish choices, and you choose to confront them in their sin and help them get back on the right track. You paraclete someone when you forgive them when they wrong you, when you encourage them when they're down. You paraclete someone when you share with them the difference that your faith has made in your own life. One of the roles of the Holy Spirit in, in paracleting us is pointing us to Jesus for salvation. We do the same thing when we help others know who Jesus is and what he's done. So who's the hurting person in your life? Who's the downtrodden? Who's the wayward? Who's the unfaithful? Who's the lost person in your life that desperately needs to hear the good news of Jesus, without which they're going to endure a Christless eternity? As Christians, our role is to paraclete, to come alongside these people and help them find hope in Christ. What an incredible ministry opportunity set forth to us by our wonderful counselor. We follow the counsel that he gives by his spirit and by his word. And we follow his example to help people find hope in him. How great it is that he does this for us. I mean, can you imagine life without his counsel? Can you imagine life without the Bible helping direct your steps? If you were completely ignorant of all of God's ways and you had no idea what God expected from your life, that would be horrible. Can you imagine life without the knowledge that the Lord stands in my defense right now? That my sin fully deserves all of God's wrath and the only thing I deserve from God is hell. But I don't get that because Jesus stands in my defense. Can you imagine life without this declaration that because of Jesus, you've been forgiven? Can you imagine what your life would be like, overwhelmed with the guilt for all the dumb stuff you've done over your life? What a terrible way to live. Can you imagine life without that timely word from a friend that you needed at just that time that God prompted them to say that and it made all the difference in the world? Can you imagine life without support and encouragement during troubling times? If you were completely isolated and on your own? That's hell, friends. And we don't ever have to endure that now or in eternity because Jesus stands in your defense. He went to the cross in your defense. His blood was poured out in your defense. The spear was shoved through his side into his heart to ensure his death in your defense. He was placed in a tomb in your defense. And he was raised from the dead in your defense. And he ascended to the right hand of the Father and right now in this very moment sits in the seat of power in heaven in your defense. Man, that's a way better way to live. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your overwhelming, saving work. We cannot imagine life without your counsel. And thank you that part of who Jesus is and part of what Jesus does is serve as our wonder of a counselor because we need him to be that for us. We need him to do that for us. And thank you that he has, and and we celebrate that today. As we do every week, we pause and take a few moments. We take communion together. We take a little piece of bread and a cup of juice to remind ourselves that Jesus Christ went to the cross in our defense to save sinners like us. And we remember a sacrificed body 
We remember shed blood. We remember a risen and reigning Savior who right now stands in our defense. What a gift. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen.